still there. And so it's important for us to recognize that there's this dialogue going on. And the National Constitution Center uh, exists to create this dialogue. Uh, one of the things we've seen, you'll see in the final part, we ask people to give their points of view specifically on marriage. And the large majority are in support of uh, marriage equality, but there are the voices of the opponents are really interesting to look at, and I think we have to continue to be aware of this dialogue going on in American society to continue to have the upward trajectory uh, in support of LGBT civil rights. I worked in the Anita Bryant campaign down in Miami, and we also did the Anita Bryant roast in Washington, which we, we raised twenty thousand dollars. Yeah, Paul's saying they raised twenty thousand dollars for Anita Bryant roast. And it is one of the powerful things about opponents is it brings us together uh, both in fundraising uh, and in thinking about how do we make the case. Uh, so, you know, that was, Anita and, Bryant really was the first Anita time we did that. Bri Anita Bryant did more to build the homosexual movement in America than anyone else because Anita Bryant managed to enrage the great mass of unorganized, non-militant, un unpolitical homosexuals. There were rallies in Sheridan Square where the city councilwoman got up and said, this is not New York City, is not Miami. And I can tell you, thousands poured in because people were so mad at her. Yeah. Paul Cunt started the boycott orange juice campaign in Miami, Florida. Oh yes, I remember that. Yeah. Mr. Cunt is the one who came up with the idea is, put those needles into the orange juice crates all over America. Right. And this was without the internet, and it <laughs> took off. And four years later, Anita Bryant, whose campaign actually touched the nerve of heterosexual America because it was called Save Our Children, yeah. Yeah. was fired by the Orange Juice Commission in the state of Florida. Yeah. yeah. First victory of the gay rights struggle. Yeah. Uh, this is looking at demonstrations in the 80s, particularly ACT UP and the uh, fight against AIDS discrimination, the battle to bring an end to the AIDS epidemic. And this is an ACT UP demonstration in front of City Hall. Uh, that's actually me. In <laughs> woo, woo, woo! Baby face me. Uh, but ACT UP had a huge impact. It, 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 and one of the things I want to mention about ACT UP is that it brought many of those GLF and GAA activists back into the trenches to fight the AIDS epidemic. So, you know, here in Philadelphia and New York and many other cities, these activists who had learned how to organize uh, nonviolent civil disobedience brought that knowledge to a new generation of activists in the AIDS epidemic. And just as those activists had learned much from the feminist movement and from many other movements. So one of the powerful things about ongoing activism is this transfer of knowledge uh, and activist wisdom from one generation to another. Uh, and this down at the bottom is the AIDS quilt at the 1987 March on Washington. Uh, this huge vision of how many people had died from AIDS uh, even in 1987, and of course those deaths continued uh, at a huge rate through the uh, invention of the protease inhibitors in 1995. So we had a long period of loss, but also a long period of organizing uh, and powerful response to that epidemic. And I think it really, when you think about the bridge from uh, gay liberation to marriage equality, AIDS activism and the battle that our community, and that was everyone came together, lesbians, gay men, bisexual, transgender people, that those folks battling that major crisis created many of the structures that allowed us then to uh, have our successes in marriage equality in many area, other areas subsequently. Uh, we are very proud to have Barbara Giddings dress. So Barbara Giddings marching oh, yes. in front of Independence Hall on the right and her dress, uh, some of the panels, and one of the things I want to point out about the panels is that the messages that they use are so current. Homosexuals should be judged as individuals. Sexual preference is irrelevant to employment. The pursuit of happiness is an inalienable right for homosexuals also. Uh, we also have a, a book that has biographies of many of the original activists down on the right-hand side that I encourage you to take a look at. And we also mentioned a number of other demonstrations from the early years. Uh, the Compton's Cafeteria right demonstration here. in San Francisco, and the Dewey's Lunch Counter sit-in, uh, which were other er other civil disobedience that took place uh, in those cities. So, you know, it's important to mention that yeah, I know, this battle them. for rights definitely predates the annual reminders, uh, and that a lot of work was going on in LA, San Francisco, and many other cities. And what was important about the annual reminders is that they were sustained. Uh, over multiple years, and and so bringing those people back together year after year, uh, the first time that that sustained effort had been maintained. 
And we draw this bridge between the animal reminders to Stonewall over here. One of my favorite quotes in the exhibit, Homo nest rated queen bees are singing you. man. <laughs> Uh, homosexuals took to the streets in New York, in New York City last weekend and joined the revolution. Uh, and there was a powerful moment where Frank Kameny and Barbara Gideon recognized that as they view it, this was the Boston Tea Party moment of our moment, and that the, the uh, attention had to shift from the more conservative approach to annual reminders to this very liberation-oriented approach, which is much more uh, in your face and much more uh, non-violent disobedience and much more bringing the message to the streets. Uh, so you see uh, annual reminder on the left, that's actually the last annual reminder, which would have taken place July 4th, 1969, so just a few weeks after Stonewall in New York. So you see that bridge, and for the first time we see women holding hands in the 1969 demonstration, which was definitely against Frank Kameny's rules. <laughs> and, uh, brave women were happy to break that rule, and I'm glad they did. Uh, so it shows that transition. See it over there on that panel um, on the lower left that the origins of the gay pride parade started in Philadelphia. There was a formal resolution passed in which the annual reminder would be transferred to New York City and renamed the Christopher Street. So, March. March. Yep. March. Okay. That's right. Yeah, um, Rich Wilson is on the committee that helped plan this exhibit, as is Bob Skiba back over here, if you could raise your hand. Uh, Bob's the curator of the archives at the William Way Community Center. So they, over these three years, helped to envision this, uh, so I want to acknowledge them. Well, I could just make a Please, David. There, but, uh, it's very interesting that, uh, to me that uh, Craig Rodwell, who had the idea for the annual reminder, yeah, Craig. and uh, Craig was fiercest critic of the Stonewall Inn. Uh, and, but it was also he who was the main propagandist of the Stonewall riots. He's the one who uh, called the newspapers and called every activist in the city, said you got to come out and support this. And he put out a flyer and circulated. So he was the one who really had the idea of keeping it going. Then it was he who had the idea of changing the annual reminder to the annual march. So I think Craig Rodwell is an important uh, link. Oh, extremely. And, uh, and the Echo Conference, which you're talking about, was called Echo, by the way, yes. which was Eastern Homophile, East Coast Paul? Homophile. Coast homophile or yeah. Um, actually broke out into a major ruckus with a good deal of the New Yorkers saying, we want to represent what happened this last year in New York because that's the new form of the movement versus the suit and ties yeah. and the dresses. And Craig Rodwell started the gay bookstore in the United States of America on Mercer Street. And before there was a Mattachine Real headquarters for us, that was where all we informal activists, I started in 1958, would go in to see what was new in books, what the new leaflets were, who was doing what where. So essentially, Craig Rodwell had created also the first gay community center. Thanks, Randy. Just as Mark Siegel got the first law, I think, passed in the country, oh, including LGBT. <laughs> he was a world shut unbelievable. Shut up. Sit and down. Sit down. Nope. And I just want to I'm here. not paid to do this. <laughs> <laughs> the other thing we have up here is Frank Rodwell's list of all the folks who came to the first annual reminders. Many of them were pseudonyms, but he did keep this bus list so that they didn't leave without everyone. So we're going to come back over into this corner. Those of you who are over there are going to be first. Uh, Randy, hi, Lillian Faderman. Oh, good how are you? Good, good to see you. Cases. This is uh, Bowers v. Hardwick, which was a key case in the 1980s. And Bowers v. Hardwick explored sex in private, whether sex in private was protected by as a constitutional right. And it was a very exciting time. We had uh, the AIDS demonstrations on the mall, as I was talking about. And the Supreme Court came down and, in fact, said that uh, homosexual citizens did not have that right. So this case actually walks you through Bowers v. Hardwick and how we got to it. Uh, but one of the interesting things about it is that, you know, the, it brought about a lot of activism. And at the end, Justice Powell, who, who did the tie-breaking vote in Bowers v. Hardwick, later came to regret his vote.
so we, we do see the evolution on the Supreme Court and attitudes towards homosexual people. Some people say it's because he had a gay clerk who uh, you know, tried to get his ear. But I think there's also, with more visibility, it was one of the brilliance of the gay is good and the movement to get people to come out, Harvey Milk's incredible message, come out. As more people came out, as more people viewed gay as good, uh, that led to changes in attitudes all over, in legislatures, in the Supreme Court, in other courts. And so you know, that argument to come out was so key. And the argument that gay is good, which was, came out of the black is beautiful argument, uh, really, again, led to this positive attitude, both among gay people themselves, but more broadly in society. Uh, we were really thrilled to get this Keith Haring image donated free from the Keith Haring Foundation, so we want to thank them. But this was a key image for National Coming Out Day in the 80s. This is Philadelphia going to the uh, demonstrations and the original program book. Uh, so again, a key moment, uh, we saw the, the, with each national march, the number of folks grew. And this was a key one, 1987, because it was just after the Bowers v. Hardwick case had come out. So it gave us an opportunity to express our displeasure.